Praise the Lord. What did Pastor Manohar preach last two times he was here? Unbelief, yes. How many of you remember those messages? Can I ask you a few questions? All right. I'm going to continue on that. Uh, he spoke something more. Unbelief and fear. All right. Today I'm going to talk to you about fear. And let me tell you, uh, it could be so different from what we have been thinking what fear is. And uh, by the end of this message, I'm sure none of you want fear in your life. I'm going to just go from the word to show you what fear is. And is there anybody in this place who doesn't have fear? Can you please raise your hands so that I can cast out the spirit of lies? No. All of us have fear. You know, I had a big, big fear. I just uh, was here, I was looking at it. Uh, and I don't know how, you know of all the phobias, right? I had glossophobia. Now you will ask me, what is that? Yes, I had glossophobia. I was in my uh, college, I was in the student Christian movement. We used to gather, there was a Christmas program. And uh, they wanted me to read two verses from the Bible. And they wanted me to come on top of a stage and read those two verses. I had glossophobia. I could never step on a stage. You know what I did? I ran away home. And I don't know who read those scriptures there. I was so frightened in standing in front of people. There was fear in my life. And I could I go, I'll be shivering. Don't look at me now. I have Jesus Christ now. Amen? Yes. All right. He casts out our fears in our lives. Yes. But all of us have fears. How many of you ladies have fear of cockroaches? How many of you are fearful of rats? We'll stand on a chair. The rat will be running. Say, Lord, take this rat away. Now, we all have fears. There was a guy. He had a fear that there was some uh, demons under his bed. So he used to go to this doctor. And he has been visiting this doctor for almost six months. So every time he goes to the doctor, the first thing the doctor asks him, has there been any progress? And he says, doctor, no. So it happened for six months. This guy got fed up. He said, let me change my doctor. So he went to a new doctor and he met him. And after that, he went back to his old doctor. When he went to the old doctor, the doctor asked him, has there been any progress? And he said, yes, doctor, there has been wonderful progress. So he asked him, what did you do? I went to another doctor. And so what, how did that doctor treat you? So this guy had the fear that there were demons under his bed and he could not sleep. And this was a fear that he had. So the other doctor told him, cut off the legs of the bed. So now you're sleeping on the floor and there was no demons under that. We need to remove this fear out of our lives. What is fear? What is fear? Absence of faith. This guy is a very, very uh, Bible teacher, let me put him. Absence of faith. What else? Fear, what is it? Fear is dread. Scared, worry, afraid. Oh, wow, that's another professor. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it basically is F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. It never is real. It's always appearing real. Now, let me tell you something from the Bible. If I find my notes, yes. What is fear according to the word of God? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Shall we all read together? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Please remove that scripture from that. Can we read together? Wonderful. So according to the word of God, what is fear? It's a spirit of fear. Yes, wonderful. So has mentioned. Fear is a spirit according to the word of God. I'm not telling you that. The word of God says fear is a spirit. It says 
spirit of fear. We read these words. One thing is sure, God has not given it to us. Be sure that God has not given us the spirit of fear. There is something called fear of God. That is something different. We are not talking about that today. That's the only positive fear that we should have in our life. But today we are talking about spirit of fear. Amen? So we need to recognize that fear is a spirit. And the other thing is, God has not given us that spear. I mean, that spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Amen? When we have uh, uh, the influence of the Holy Spirit in our life, it is called anointing. Yes? And this anointing of the Holy Spirit empowers us to do things which we cannot do. It empowers us to think in ways that God thinks. When we have that anointing of the Holy Spirit into our life, we are enabled. Today I'm standing here, I, I told you I had glossophobia. I used to be afraid of standing in front of people. Today, I, I am not afraid of standing in front of people because of the grace of God. Because of the Holy Spirit enables me to stand here and speak. Maybe some of you won't believe, you know, Dennis is telling lies. No, I could not stand here. I would shiver. But I used to be so frightened. But when the Holy Spirit came upon me, today I can stand and preach the gospel. I'm not afraid about it anymore. It's because of God's grace. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it empowers you. It emboldens you. It gives you courage. causes you to be bold. He, his empowerment means a Christian can do things that he never in his own strength could do. I could never do it in my own strength. Today I can do it by the strength of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, the presence of the spirit of fear in your life also brings with it an anointing. The spirit of fear also brings with it an anointing in your life. A negative, destructive anointing in your life. So when you allow that spirit of fear come into your life, there is a negative, destructive anointing that is in your life. Instead of empowering you, it makes you fearful. Brother just gave a wonderful example of what was happening in his office. If the money didn't come in, there was no money to give out. Everything would be in stake. What happened? Fear walked in. When fear walks in, you get sleepless nights. You get fear. Uh, your digestive system, there are a lot of uh, physical, I mean, biological things that happen when fear is in your life. There are certain hormones released that create, your stress level goes up. Uh, they could get into depression and all sort of things. So, with the spirit of fear, there is an anointing that comes in. Instead of empowering you, it fears, it makes you fearful, it paralyzes you. Instead of giving you wisdom, fear causes you to make poor decisions. When you are fearful, that decision that you make is the worst decision. And if you recollect, some of the times I was fearful and I made that decision and that's why I am where I am today. So you've got to be careful. Instead of blessing of the true anointing of the Holy Spirit, the de uh, demonic anointing of a spirit of fear brings a curse into your life. So now we're looking at fear is not a simple thing. It is a spirit and with that spirit, a lot of negative things come into your life. Now let's look at Mark, I, mean, I don't want to go there, Mark 5. Everybody knows the madman at uh, uh, Gadara. The man was mad. He used to break the chains. He used to do things which was impossible for a man to do. So there was a demonic anointing. He had a legion of demons in him. And there was an anointing that made him break. Humanly it was possible to, not to break those chains. But because of the demonic anointing that was upon this madman, he could break those chains. Yeah? The supernatural anointing also turned this man into one of the most miserable person on earth at that time. Because of the demonic anointing. And that is what happens when you have that demonic anointing with the spirit of fear. The anointing that comes with the spirit of fear will make you miserable and wretched. All of us have gone at some time or the other through fear. Maybe loss of job, maybe a health issue. Maybe a want of money, uh, whatever, uh, something, uh, somebody finding out. We have all gone through various places of fear. And we know how 
we behaved at that time. Now, let me talk to you about two principles that govern the earth. I'm taking you somewhere. I want you to pay close attention to what I'm saying. According to Romans chapter 12, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 12, there are only two laws in this earth that operates for human beings, right? Okay, Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Next words. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Whether you know it or not, there are only two laws. The first law is the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus or the law of sin and death. You are either operating in the law of uh, spirit of life in Christ Jesus or uh, we are operating in the law of sin and death. The sad part is many believers, many Christians are operating according to the law of sin and death. Now there are only these two laws. We Christians think there is a third side. No, a coin has only two sides. It's a head or a tail. How many times have you tossed a coin and it fell to vertical? Neither head or tail. It has happened to you? No. There is only two sides. I'm, I'm not saying that can't happen. But there are only two sides. Either you operate in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus or you operate in the law of sin and death. Now, every human being living on this earth is operating under either one of them. Yeah? Let's go a little bit forward. So, what is the law? These are the two laws I talked to you about. Uh, let me take a simple example of gravity. How many of you know to calculate the force of gravity? The formula. Engineers? Well, we don't know. Many of us don't know. But does the law of gravity work in our life? All right. Just because I'm a believer, I go to the top of a uh, building and walk into the air. Will I go up to heaven? Yes, I might. If I fall down. But the law of gravity says you will come down. Correct? So you throw a stone straight up and you think that stone will go somewhere else. No, it will come straight down on your head. The law operates whether you know the law or not. It still continues to operate. Similarly, these laws will operate whether you know it or not. So there are only two laws. The law of uh, spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Or just call the law of life. And the law of sin and death. Amen. Alright. So the same is true of the spiritual laws. Whether we know it or not. We have not read about it. We learned about it. It still is operating in our lives. Now. Every. Both these laws. They have forces. And substances. That operate in these laws. For example, in the law of life, we have the force of hope. We have a hope. In the uh, uh, law of life, we have agape love. A love uh, that uh, we don't expect anything in return. In, in the uh, law of life, we have another force called faith. Now in the law of sin and death, you have despair. You have total, instead of agape love, you have total selfishness. And according to the word, the most powerful uh, force that is there in the spirit of life is faith. The word of God says that faith can move. Have you ever thought the magnitude of that word? If we have faith, it says you can move. How many of you have been to a lane? You've gone up the Jabal Hafid? If you had faith, you can move that mountain. Thing is, we don't have that faith to move that mountain. That's our problem. But that is how powerful that force of faith is in the law of life. When it comes to the law of death, there is a force as powerful as faith. In the law of sin and death, what is that force? Wow, you are wonderful students. I don't have to preach anymore. So that force that works in the law of spirit and death is called fear. The same way like faith can move mountains, fear can also do. It's just that it is destructive, negative. Everything is to a collapse. Faith is a very positive thing. Fear 
will do the same thing, but in a very negative thing. All right, let me show you one incident, and now I will show you about faith. Uh, uh, Pastor Mano spoke about it, but about faith and fear. Let's look at this for Matthew 8, verse 25 and 26. Here Jesus was preaching, and uh, he said, let us go to the other side, in the Sea of Galilee, or in that, and he was sleeping on that boat. And his disciples were fishermen. Fishermen who had gone into the sea, experienced storms, they have experienced all sort of uh, uh, situations in that sea. And they were bold enough to do things. But the day they were traveling with Jesus, Jesus was sleeping. And uh, the word of God says in Matthew chapter 8 verse 25, Then his disciples came to him, woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Remember these were fishermen who have been in storms before. So it must have been a pretty bad storm. All right, next words. Jesus woke up and he said, what did he say? Let's read that together. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? I want you to see this. We'll go to uh, different uh, gospels. We'll look at these words so that we'll understand. So Jesus told them, why are you fearful? And then he said, O you little faith. Little faith, fear comes in. What about our lives? Do we have faith to prevent the fear from coming into our lives? Oh, my finances are finished. What am I going to do? Fear comes in. I will show you how to operate in that. Okay, so we saw here, uh, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Let's go to another uh, description of the same incident. Mark 4, verse 40. Mark 4, 40. I want you to see this. Jesus, same situation, same boat, everything same. But now what? Somebody else describes it, Mark. But he said to them, Why are you fearful that you have no faith? What did Matthew say? Why are you fearful that you have little faith? Now here he says, Why are you fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now let's look at uh, Luke 8.25. Luke 8.25 And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were afraid. I want you to see how God brought it about in his gospels as a superlative thing. First words he said, Why are you fearful? Or are you of little faith? Then he said, Why are you fearful? That you have no faith. And then he said, Where is your faith? So the bottom line is, No faith? There is fear. Good faith, no fear. Little faith, you still have fear. So if you want to get rid of fear in your life, you need to have faith. The word of God tells us in Hebrews, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Fear cometh by hearing and hearing everything that is contrary to the word of God. You can even talk about saying lies of the devil. If we want faith in our life, we need to be disciples of the word of God. If you are just spending uh, once a week uh, on a Friday coming to church to listen to the word of God, I can guarantee you the spirit of fear is in your life. We got to be people who build faith so that we do not have fear in our life. I will show you what fear can do. Let's go there immediately. Job chapter 3 verse 25. I want you to understand this. What Job feared came into his life. What are we fearing? What are we fearing about our children? What are we fearing about our, uh, our job? What are we fearing about our family? The word of God says what Job feared came into, it, came into his life. Don't have Job 3.25. For the things that I greatly feared has come upon me. We talk about Job, I mean, I don't want to get into this detail, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, the things I greatly feared has come upon me. There was a sister, she had cancer. And I don't know, when I was praying for her, God told me to tell her, do not have fear, because what you fear will come upon me. 
And she said, yes, pastor, I was just fearing that I'll die. When we are praying and we have what we fear, we will not receive the answer to the prayer because of the fear that we have. I will show you how the team works. Uh, we have fear. Just go to Job 1, 5. And so it was when the days of feasting had run the course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise, rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sin, sons have sinned and cursed God in the hearts. So rem understand the fear that Job had. If Job had this fear that his sons would have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. How many of us pray because of fear? Our fearful prayers will never be answered. Some of us would say, Pastor, I'm praying because I'm afraid this would happen. Don't do that. Many of us do that. I've done it before. We pray because of fear. No, pray because God has promised you in His word that He would do it. Amen? That's very important. Don't pray because something, uh, uh, you're afraid something is going to happen. That's the wrong way. Today, stand on His promise and pray. If you, uh, <clears throat> if you ask anything according to His word, He will hear us. And if you know that He heard us, we know we have the petition that we asked of Him. Amen? I think it's 1 John 5.14. All right, so do we want fear in our life? What we fear, we fear about our job. We feel fear that, okay, I have this curse in my life that it will repeat after that many. Break that fear. We are fear one of the other things the parents have is fear of my child. Oh, he will become like that, like this, like this. No. Let's not pray because he's going to go away. Let's pray. Bible says, bring up the child in the way he should go so that when he grows old, he will not depart from it. I will have the peace of my children. That's the word of God. Pray according to that. We don't get fearful about and then pray God, prevent that from happening. Because a fearful prayer is different. Maybe we'll talk about when we talk about prayer. So, what job fear came upon him? If we were able to project all our fears onto the screen. None of us would want that, correct? So let us not fear. All right. So, uh, so we looked at where there is no faith, there is fear. And where there is fear, there is no faith. Where there is faith, there is no fear. Have I confused you enough on that? All right. So we know the thing between faith and fear. Amen. And it's very, very important, my brothers and sisters, today... We are not spending enough time in the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Maybe 20 years ago there was not what is available today. Today we have so many things available to study the word of God. Even we made a quiz, a Luke, so that people will study the book of Luke. Uh, but we need to learn to study the word of God. We need to understand his promises. We need to understand him. Man, we got to be disciples. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. If you have been hearing, let me ask you something. Fear cometh by every word that is contrary to the word of God. How do we understand that the word is contrary to the word of God? You must be listening to a worldly music. How do you know the verse in that music is contrary to the word of God? If you don't know the word of God. So we need to know the word of God. So we know what is contrary. Today you have hundreds of, uh, less in this part of the world, but hundreds of talk shows. They talk about standards of the world. But how do we know that that is contrary to the uh, word of God? Unless we know what is the word of God. Adultery, fornication, they were moral things. But if we did not know the word of God, it's a sin. So it's very important that we should be disciples of the word of God so that we know that anything that comes contrary to the word of God would bring fear into our life. And we need to know what is in the word of God to say that this is... I mean, people have heard uh, our children listening to worldly music. But some of the words in that worldly music is demonic. There are so much cartoons available today. They are all demonic. But our children are watching and growing with that. But we should know the word of God so that we can say... Why? Don't tell your kid not to watch that. Tell them why you should not watch it. 
Today the word children want to understand things. They need to know why. What is wrong? Take the word of God and show it to them. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Fear cometh by hearing and hearing the contrary to the word of God. Amen? All the lies of the devil. So faith and fear are two reciprocal forces that is acting in this world. Amen? The law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the law we saw. And the law of sin and death. And we saw these two forces. One operates by faith. The other operates by fear. Now, what determines on which side you are? What determines on which side you are? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Everybody knows the scripture by heart. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. These are the two laws they are talking about. Law of sin and death. And law of life in Christ Jesus. So these are the two laws that you have. And it says. That you can activate. Which law you want to operate under. How? But the words that you speak. The word of God says. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. Law of sin and death. Law of life in Christ Jesus. How do we operate in which law you are working under? It's by the words that we speak. So you employ one of these teams. Either you employ the team of life in Christ Jesus or you employ the, uh, the law of sin and death. The team of sin and death. How do we do that? Let's take an example. For example, you went to, uh, somebody went to a doctor and the doctor gave a very negative report. What would that person, whether believer or not, what would that person do? First, call the closest friend and tell everything the doctor said. You know, doctor said, this uh, sickness is uncurable. There's no medicine for it. I will have to suffer through this. So what are we confessing? You're, and you don't do it once because it's not that you have only one friend. You do it twice. You do it thrice. You do it four times. You do it five times. So what are you doing? You are confessing death. The Bible says life and death is in the power of your tongue. So you came back uh, and immediately you started confessing. You know my brother, what the doctor said, there's no medicine. I will have to suffer this. I don't know what will happen. This is what will happen to my system. This is what will happen to my blood pressure. This is what will the test be. To one person you said. To the next person you will say the same thing. And third person, did you know? Then you'll call your father, you'll call your mother, you will call your sister, you'll call your brother. Tell everybody what death. We got to be people who speak life. Uh, I, I don't know if I shared this with you. When uh, Delina was small, she had some rash on her toes. And we went to a skin specialist. And the skin specialist said, oh, she will have this all through her life. It will not go. Me and Bina both were sitting there. We are just fresh believers. So what? We, we learned a few things. In Jesus' name, we cancel that statement. Doctor asked, what did you say? I mean, after one week, it went and never came back again. Now we could have accepted it and said, a doctor said that this will happen. Oh my God. I mean, doctors are saying facts. I'm not saying that, thank God there are no doctors here. In Abu Dhabi church, we have a lot of doctors. Uh, but uh, thank God. But doctors are saying the fact. What are we speaking? Okay, something happens in your office. Let's take an example of my brother. He told about collection. Yes, we have a motto in our company. No sales is complete till the money comes in. Yeah, good one. Put it on your board, brother. <laughs> Write my name at the bottom if you want. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. So, uh, thing about collection. Uh, maybe uh, brother did different, but somebody else would have gone. He would have said, you know what? There's no money coming. This customer, they can't pay up. You know what is happening? They don't have money to pay. It's almost six months. Oh, and the three months. Oh, money is just staying there. All these, we have four big customers. All of us, them are not paying. The company will close down. There'll be no money to run. We won't be able to pay out insurance. What are we speaking? Death. But as a believer, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Amen? I'll give you a story, nothing to do with me. It is all God's grace. Recently, we had done a job in Fujairah for one concrete repair of some uh, tunnels. And this guy's first check, I mean, he used to give us a lot of money. The first check was worth 100,000 uh, dirhams. Uh, and he was supposed to give it to us in uh, July. And then my owner told me, 
uh, this guy is not paying up, put a case. Oh, and it became very panicky situations and uh, called the lawyer, called the finance manager, all big issues happened. And then they came to me, I said, don't worry, well, I'll go try to get it. Uh, uh, to cut the story short, yes, he took me two weeks, but uh, on the first, yes, the money was transferred to the bank. Amen? I don't know, I, I mean, I, I share my things with my wife, and we pray. We pray together. If two of you agree anything, I'm stretching on this earth and ask, it shall be done by the Father, yes. I mean, there's nothing I can do. I can't go kill the guy. I can't go hit the guy. I can't send uh, some gundas to collect money. But I have a Savior whom I can pray. I don't, I mean, what we need to do is, do not let these negative things make wrong decisions. The spirit of fear comes in. I mean, uh, you know, when we do deliverance, uh, by God's grace, we do deliverance. And every time, uh, one of the things that I also learn from my wife is, we ask the demon, what right you have to stay in this body? And it's with Christians. We are Christians. So they will tell us there is a right. And one of the right is opening the door for fear to come into your life. With fear comes some other spirits also. Well, that's not our subject today. So, which team are we recruiting? We can recruit the right team with the words that we speak. The word of God says that Jesus is the high priest of our confession. The word of God says, the angels look forward to perform God's word in our life. So when we go through situations, when we speak the word of God, what happens? God and his angels look forward to perform it. But don't forget, the devil and his team is waiting to perform what you say. I mean, many of, uh, man, one, one, one of the other common statements a lot of people make is, I wish I was dead. You might be going through trouble. You might be going through situations. You might be broke. You might be about to lose a job. You might be having pressure in your office. And we make the statement, I wish I was dead. The word of God tells us in some, I will not die, but live to glorify the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the words that we need to speak. When you speak, when, when you speak the word, I wish I was dead, husband and wife has a, a fight. And the first thing say, I wish I never married you. That's a huge statement to say. You might even say, I want to divorce you. But that's a big statement to say. The life of uh, the law of spirit and, uh, and the law of death will start operating immediately. Because you have confessed. He has a right to get that thing authorized into your life. And people come to us for counseling. And one of the things we ask them, did you ever say, that? oh, you're so many times. Then why are you surprised that you're reaching to a divorce case? Because we have uttered it. We have allowed that to operate. Life and death is in the power of your tongue and you can enjoy its fruit thereof. What are we confessing when we go through situations? Are we allowing that fear to cut into our lives or are we standing on the word of God and declaring it? Yes, we, we all go through situations. I mean, we all learn on the way, we learn on the way, we learn on the way. But we need to learn to speak the word of God into every situation so that we do not. Fear will come in. Devil will try to bring fear into your life. And you guess what? That when I say, uh, let's say um, about that sickness, and you, uh, one team is like you confess to everybody what the doctor said. And that is the negative thing that brings death. But at the same time, when you, when you have that uh, doctor declared, you came out and he said, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Jesus took my stripes on his back and this sickness has to go. The word of God tells me in Matthew 18 that he bore my sickness. He took my infirmity so I will not have this sickness anymore. What is the word? Life. The word of God says God is the high priest of our, Jesus is the high priest of our confession. So Jesus will make sure that happens into our life. When we go through tight situations financially, what are the words that we're speaking? Oh, why did we come to this situation? Why did we do this? Of, what happens when the uh, Israelites got out of Egypt? They were murmuring. There was only one guy, who Joseph, uh, Moses, who spoke the word of God. We got to be like that. We should not recruit the team of death. We should recruit the team of life. Now let me tell you, for example, the sickness case. One week passed. You stood on the word of God. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Know this. What happened? Your symptoms are getting bad. It's getting more painful. And then you go and say, nothing is happening. So now what has happened? You recruited the other team. So you could be recruiting a team 
uh, of uh, uh, law of spirit in Christ Jesus. But then with your another, after a week of, you need patience. The word that I use is plug in. There's no plug in. What happens if you remove the plug? There's no power. We need to stay plugged in. We need to confess the word of God. We need to speak the word of God. As you speak the word of God, let me tell you, your faith increases. A time will come when your head knowledge and your faith, I mean, your heart knowledge becomes one. Miracles will start taking place. Do not recruit the team of death. So it, it is up to us whom we are recruiting into our lives. Are we recruiting the team of death or are we are recruiting the team of life? See, uh, uh, you have heard this uh, that by two or more witnesses, a thing is established. We all heard that. I'm not going to the scriptures, but if you want, anybody's writing down, you can write down. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Matthew 18, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Timothy 5, verse 19. And Hebrew 10, verse 28. From heaven's perspective, it takes two witnesses to establish a fact. From heaven's perspective, it takes two witnesses to establish a fact. Let's take an example. Let's take healing only. The word of God tells us in 1 Peter 2 verse 24 that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Yes? Now, the devil tells, you got the sickness and you're going to die. So these are two facts. One could be a true, uh, one could be true, or both could be true, or one could be false, one, uh, and uh, the other one true. Now, who established the second witness? You and me. So you have two things. The Bible says anything is established by two witnesses. So one, the word of God says that by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Now, you are the second witness who can establish that fact. You could say, no, I believe the doctor that I'm going to die. Or you can stand on the word of God says, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. If it's for finances, thank you, Lord. Your plans for me is to prosper me and give me an expectant and not of evil. How many of you know that God delights in the prosperity of his children? That's the word of God in, uh, in Psalms. And I pray, Lord, let your name be glorified that I will prosper and be a blessing for your children. That's God's word. So we can establish uh, the word by being the witness. You can establish the negative or you can establish the positive. It's up to us. We need to recognize what we establish. And uh, uh, there was this flight that was going on. Uh, the flight. Suddenly there was turbulence. Uh, there was turbulence in the flight. And uh, the... Pilot announced of the system, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah? So normally what happens, how many of you have been in bad turbulence in a flight? Nobody? Ah. Oh. So what happens normally? Does fear come in? Do you write your last minute will immediately? <laughs> don't worry, that gets burned off, you know. <laughs> so those are the times you stand on the word of God. Yeah? And you proclaim. What do you proclaim? Psalm 91. But to proclaim Psalm 91, we need to know Psalm 91. I will be, I'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my fortress. Yeah. 10,000 may fall on my side and all that, but nothing will happen to me. You need to take the word and speak the word at that time. Are you getting that? Amen? So we saw how fear operates. We have, okay, let me give you a small story. There was a plight like this. There was a big uh, uh, announcement came on the, uh, uh, on, on the system. The pilot said, one of my engine is on fire and uh, I just found out the other engine is on fire. I don't know how we are going to land. So everybody started panicking, crying, yelling, shouting. There was an old man. There was a pastor. He said, this is the time for us to pray. So everybody listened to the pastor and they all started praying. Then the pastor looked, there was one man. Everybody was bowed and praying, there was one man. Then he went to him and said, why are you not praying? He said, pastor, I don't know to pray. Then pastor said, do something religious at least. So he removed his hat and passed it around for collection. <laughs> all right. 
So breaking the bondage of fear. Hebrew chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Alright, Hebrew chapter 2 verse 14. In as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, uh, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And let's read 15 words. And release them or deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Alright. When you have fear, you get into bondage. So the spirit of fear gets into you. The next thing you are in bondage. Today many of us are in bondage for maybe drinking or smoking or watching something. It's because of the spirit of fear. And the word of God says when Jesus died, not only for our salvation, but to release us from the spirit. What he says, from the fear through fear of death, we're always subject to bondage. He died so that we'd be released from that bondage. Amen. So we need to know that Jesus has sacrificed himself so that we can be released from the spirit of fear and bondage. Amen. God has not given us the spirit of fear. It is not who God who is giving us. But Jesus came into this earth. He suffered and died so that you and me, we can be set free from bondage. All right. One of the things that happens... Uh, before fear comes in. Uh, how many of you remember Benny Hinn came to Dubai many years ago? Before Benny Hinn came, we had it at the airport exhibition center. Before Benny Hinn came, uh, about uh, two months ago, a team came. A full team of Benny Hinn came. They saw the place. They saw the arrangements. They discussed everything. So they came before so that when Benny Hinn comes, it will be easy for him. Before fear can come into your life. Somebody comes before and that somebody is called doubt. What happened in the garden of Eden? The devil asked Eve, did God say you will surely die? Doubt. So the first thing that comes into our life before fear comes into our life is doubt. We doubt the word of God. We doubt the promises of God. And then once doubt is into your life, it becomes very easy for the uh, fear to walk into your life. So we, the minute doubt comes into our life, cancel that doubt, kick out that doubt with the word of God. And that is very important. Uh, again, I can take you to Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 25 to 31. You know about Peter. Jesus was walking on the water. He finished the uh, sermon. He went to the mountain. He prayed. And the boat was already in the water. And then Jesus was walking to the water. And Peter said, Lord, if it is you, bid that I come to you. And Jesus said, come. So Peter walked on the water and he went to Jesus. Okay, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sing, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Next words. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you are little faith. What is the word? Let's read all together. Why did you doubt? Today, you and me, we are doubting God's word. We are willing to believe what Gulf News says. We are willing to believe what Kali's time says. But we are not willing to say what the word of God says. Why do we doubt? God is asking us the same thing. God has given us His promises. God has given us uh, all the promises to live a pro uh, victorious life. But then He's asking, why do you doubt? Because when Peter doubted, he saw everything else. He removed his focus from Jesus. He looked at the waves. He looked at the boisterous wind. And then he started sinking. The minute we start doubting about God's word, fear will come in. We got to stop. When the doubt comes immediately, I cancel that. I believe the word of God. I confess the word of God. I believe it. That settles it. I believe it. I, I, I receive it in Jesus' name. We should not allow doubt to come into our lives. If we allow doubt to come into our lives, then after that next is fear. And it is the spirit of fear that comes in. Alright. Let's go to, uh, in the last 15 minutes, I don't today we won't have time for prayer, but I want you to get this. Uprooting the spirit of fear. How do we uproot the spirit of fear from our lives? How many of you want fear out of your life? Fear of cockroaches or uh, rats, not that. Fear of anything, right? I see many hands. The first one is make a quality decision. The first thing we need to do is make a quality decision. And that quality decision is, I want fear out of my life. Yep. 
to break free of fear first you must make a quality decision to do this and many many people miss on this part they don't make a quality decision i mean let's look at psalm 118 verse 6 psalm 118 verse 6 what did david say the lord is on my side i will not fear david made a decision doesn't matter what happens he was standing in front of goliath he was the goliath the giant he was killing everybody but he made a decision God is on my side I will not fear. It was all right for a shepherd boy to fear and run away compared to all the soldiers they were all running away. But David had made up his mind and said I will not fear. God is on my side. What about you and me? Can we say that I will not fear because God is on my side? Shall we say all that together? God is on my side I will not fear what man can do to me. Just imagine if Jesus is with you, He stays with you, He is in your workplace. Would you fear? Would you be worried about anything? First thing is make that decision and know that God is on your side, and that's what David did. You get into a fear by act of your will. David decided not to get into fear by an act of his will, and he said, "I will not fear." We need to be people who will say the same thing. Uh, receiving fear and getting rid of fear requires your cooperation and your will so you need to make a decision i told you about uh, the aer aeroplane incident no so when you need to get things uh, fear out of your life the first thing that you need to make a quality decision understand that god is on our side i'm going faster uh, romans 8:31 and 32 i mean those so beautiful scriptures what god promises what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who can be against us brother my whole in law family is against me brother they are doing everything against me brother oh we are so fearful of what is going to happen but what does god's word say if god is for us who can be against us we have doubt about god's word and it's time my brothers and sisters that we believe his word Amen. The second one is so the first one is make a quality decision knowing that God is on your side. Lord, I will not fear. Second one is understanding the magnitude of God's protection. We sometimes do not understand the magnitude of God's protection. Isaiah 43 verse 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord who created you O Jacob and he who formed you O Israel, fear not. You know somebody told me the other day there are 365 times that god has written fear not in the word of god how many times how many days are there in a year and god knew that we would get fearful that's why he said fear not 365 times am i all right but thus says the lord who created you o jacob and you who formed you israel fear not for i have redeemed you i have called you by name you are mine Hey God is telling you are mine. Just imagine a father somebody is uh, trying to hurt your child when you go to a supermarket. So what will a father go? He just goes there and say he is mine, correct? God the father is telling us that we are his. We need to understand the magnitude of God's protection over our lives. Amen. And it says uh, <clears throat> I mean uh, that's why I talked to you about Psalm 91. Uh, we need to tell the devil i live in the secret place of the almighty god amen 1000 may fall at your right hand 10000 on your left hand but no calamity will befall you god has given his angels charge over us we need to understand the magnitude of god's protection in our life one of the reason we allow fear to come in we don't understand the magnitude we need to go back to the word of god and it's so easy these days go to the internet and write god's protection verses you get a list of all these verses early days we had to search the bible by concord bible see all that today nothing just press it and when i used to hear all these preachers preaching and i said how come they connect all these words how come they know the knowledge of the whole bible but now it's very easy you know press a button you get all the verses go home and do that understand the magnitude of god's this 
He says, I have called you by name. He knows each one of us by name. New Testament says, He knows the every hair on our head. Alright, third, develop confidence in God's promise. Develop confidence in God's promise. Enemy's number one strategy is to keep you locked into a lifestyle of fear to try to keep you away from God's promise. We need to be people that we will develop and know and know and know what God promised. I mean, in Numbers uh, 23, verse 19, he says, God is not a man who should lie, nor a son of man who should not keep his words. I, let, I think Paul said, let every man be a liar and God true. Amen? God, if he has said it in his word, we should come to a place. Lord, you said it in your word. I believe it. I receive it. That settles it. The thing is, when situation comes, we be become like Peter. We look at the boisterous wind. We look at the waves. Doubt comes into our might and we start sinking. And we let fear come into our life. Yeah? All right. And the most important one, the last one is, fourth one, is employ perfect love. 1 John 4, 17 and 18. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. And 18, let's read this together, please. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been perfect in love. God has given us the agape love. Agape love is a love that asks for no returns. You're doing it because you love somebody. God did it for us. The Bible says when we were yet sinners, He did it for us. Yeah? So, we need to operate in perfect love. I'll tell you, a lot of fear will get out. It says, uh, but perfect love cast out fear. Perfect love cast out fear. When we operate in love, your boss must be the worst guy. Your colleague must be the guy who is doing all the double crossing. It's difficult. Your brother might be doing things against you. Still operate in perfect law. Because that blocks the spirit of fear coming into your life. Because we do not operate in perfect law, we allow a lot of fear to come into our lives. I think I'll stop here. We just got uh, uh, just about uh, enough time. Maybe God willing, we'll continue on this. There's a lot more that we can learn about fear. But make up your mind today. God doesn't want. The word of God says... God has not given us the spirit of fear. And many of us are operating in fear. Fear of sickness, fear of our job, maybe visa. But it is time to turn it around. Hire the right team. Understand that we are walking under our two laws. Law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. And whom are we hiring? Which team are we hiring? Are we hiring the team of death or are we hiring the team of life? And that is possible, as we saw in Proverbs 8, 21, by life and death is in the power of your tongue. Amen? Um, we'll pray together right now. I don't think we have enough time to pray individually because uh, we're almost up on time. Take this minute. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those things to you. That spirit of fear will be cast out in Jesus' name. Can you put up to 2 Timothy 1, 7 on the... Projection, please. O Rabashi Kalara Baranta Nakara, Bari Kalara Baranta Nakara, Bari the Brutuna Massa Kalanta Nakaraba, Re Kalara Baranta Nakara, Bari the Brutuna Masha Kalaraba. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's see out this together. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Every spirit of fear in my life, I command you, get out in Jesus' name. I am the child of God. My body has been washed with the blood of Jesus. I belong to Jesus Christ. Spirit of fear, you have no place in my life. Get out and never come back. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, once again, we want to thank you and praise you for this wonderful time that we had in your presence. 
Thank you for speaking to each one of us, Lord. And every spirit of fear will live us in Jesus' name. Lord, we will be your disciples of your word, Father God. That our faith will be increased by hearing and hearing your word, Father God. Lead us and guide us, Father God, to walk in victory that Jesus has purchased for each one of us, Lord. We thank you and praise for the blessed week ahead that you're giving us. Lead us and guide us, Lord. Once again, we pray for Pastor Manohar and family. Continue to bless them. And all our brothers and sisters who are on vacation, your head, your protection be around them, Lord. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray.